there. And uh, everybody knows Guo Guangchang, and uh, he's well known among the 80s. And uh, so you're taking my self introduction. You know, I, I believe that he won't introduce himself. Uh, let me tell you why we are here today. So, all of the, uh, all of us are alumni from Fuda University. We were born in the 1960s. We know we've known each other for a very long time, but this is a special time. And Party Secretary Li Qiang in Shanghai announced to reopen our economy in the beginning of May, and the economy is very important. So, as a medical expert, I have known Guangchang for quite a long period of time. I don't normally spend time with with him because uh, it's always a lot of pressure staying together with him. But today, it's very important because economy and epidemic control have become the two most important agendas of the country. So that is why our dialogue is very important. And uh, Guo Guangchang is a very prominent figure amongst people born in the 1960s. Well, let me quickly say that I, I don't used to spend a lot of time with doctors because previously, if you spend a lot of time with doctors, you're not considered healthy. And right now, it's fashion to be together with doctors. Uh, let me tell you that so we are broadcasting this program live on CGTN and uh, on our app. And uh, we are also broadcasting this program live on the home of Fosan which is a macro application on WeChat. And uh, now, why don't we get started? So Shanghai has announced to reopen its economy on May the 5th. Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Hubei, and Zhejiang, they have released a lot of uh, consumption coupons. So I want to ask Guochang, Guangchang, and I know Professor Zhang is very busy, but let me ask you, Mr. Gu, do you do a lot of shopping? I don't, actually, and uh, because uh, my home boss is in charge of everything. And uh, for Fosun Group, we had a lot of um, discounts and promotion going on on May the 5th, and uh, we have a lot of uh, shops across the country. We truly have learned a lot from the others. And now, Professor Zhang, you must be even busier than Guangchang talking about reopening the economy in Shanghai. Well, let me, t let me ask you, what are the contri contributions that you can do? Well, if you think shopping is a contribution, I didn't make any contrib because, contribution because I haven't about anything, you know, I'm leading a very simple life. I don't need to do the shopping myself, and I don't change my clothes quite often. Uh, I have uh, 10 suits like this and 10 pants just like this, and I don't buy, I only shop like once in, twi in two years, And but I have made two contributions, and uh, on May the 7th, I went to a promotion fair on Huai Hai Road, and I think that's very important because I know that uh, the Shanghai government is determined to reopen the economy, and I want to thank our netizens in the country for giving me your trust. And uh, everybody knows everybody knows that I'm not there to promote any products, and I, I was just paying a visit there. So the same goes here. Number one, I'm very happy to be joined with two of the prominent alumni of uh, Fuda University. And secondly, we're having this dialogue after Party Secretary of Li Qiang, Party Secretary Li Qiang of Shanghai announced the reopening of, the, of our economy on May the 5th. So without economic development, what is the point of winning the fight? We have to make a living. The pandemic has changed everything. 
the way we live, we study, and we work. I know that uh, prior to the pandemic, you were having a meeting in Davos, and the moment you came back, you realized that everything has changed. Uh, over the past few months, what do you think is the most drastic change? Well, if you talk about the past months, well, over the past months, I have visited 15 places. Uh, but in Shanghai, I did three nuclear acid tests. <laughs> and when are you uh, asking Mr. Zhang to sit in the center? My understanding of China's fight against the pandemic is that I have every confidence in China's fight against the coronavirus. For quite a long period of time, we don't have any domestic cases. And uh, in Shanghai, we are doing 6,000 tests every day. And we don't see not even one case. And uh, I'm also serving as the head of Shanghai COVID-19 medical treatment team because every day I'm watching the figure and data, and I see zero for quite a number of days. And uh, so that is why I believe in the results of China's fight against this pandemic. And if I'm not here, if I'm busy fighting on the front line, it shows that I'm not trusting this, da this data. Well, I'm having a lot of concerns for others. I myself, I have every confidence in the result of the test. My wife is one of your fans. And uh, you said that it's totally OK to travel to Wuhan, but I I visited Duhan, and uh, from the eyes of the people, I see a slight change, and there is still this nervousness. And uh, then I then I tell everybody that I have done a test, and then everybody laughs. So it's not just a medical issue; it's also an issue of trust. Well, I can understand this. Well, no one invites me to Wuhan these days. My understanding of the incurrence rate in Wuhan is that as long as we take regular measures, most basic measures, for example, masks and social distancing, and then there should be no problem. And that is why I advocate for the reopening of the city. And right now, Wuhan is launching a citywide testing. And this is not just for medical purposes, and it's also for trust purposes. And uh, so it has become a social issue, it's not just a medical issue. Because without doing that, there is insufficient amount of trust between one another. And also from a medical perspective, if you have a positive uh, result, I have to do double, double check. And from the medical perspective, you have to be very careful confirming a case. Well, I'm going to ask Guang Chang later, but let me focus on you, Mr. Zhang. Everybody is saying that uh, the reason we reopen our schools and factories is that we have an underlying threat. We have an underlying threat that is not clearly uh, defined. And that is why we are having this uh, nationwide testing, and in particular in Hubei. And it's not just a medical issue, it's also a social issue. It's because of this demand that we are doing this. So Wuhan is conducting a citywide testing. But if we have a pace in China that has registered some scattered cases, um, maybe it's a two-digit figure. And then is it necessary to conduct a citywide testing in that place? So Wuhan is currently well underway in the test, and uh, it's going to accomplish that in 10 days. And uh, I can never imagine any country completing a test that covers more than 10 million people. And that's just unimaginable in anywhere else in the world. And it can only be possible in a big manufacturing power like China. And so Wuhan is doing exactly that. 
Let's, for example, in Shanghai, I don't have any case. Uh, trust me, there is no case in Shanghai. I have been here for quite a number of days. And, but if we had one or two cases in Shanghai, then do we need to conduct a citywide testing? No, not necessary at all. And uh, the municipal leaders of Shanghai haven't approached me for this question. But if they did, well, we we'll give them the answer, same answer if you know the question is from me in Shanghai. But to answer any question, we have to be science-based. And I believe that it should be science-based in anywhere else in China. And uh, so we're not, we're not talking about this social issue. And there is this social demand of testing. But I do not have much knowledge about the social studies. But I'm telling you from the medical perspective that if we have one or two cases in Shanghai, it's totally not necessary to conduct a citywide testing in Shanghai. There are two science bases. Number one, Shanghai is the city with the population of 30 million. And within one or two weeks, we practiced the lockdown. And that was fairly unimaginable. And number two, in the first half of this year, everybody knows that the pandemic will not finish in the near term, and uh, Europe and the U.S., they are considering of reopening civil aviation. And I believe that uh, there will be a huge amount of uh, flow of people and uh, commodities. And uh, Guangzhou is a businessman. He knows that uh, you know he won't survive if there is no flow of commodities and people. And uh, so, with this big flow of people, there there might be one or two or three cases. If you know, I'm right now having no cases in Shanghai. But what if there are two or three cases coming in in Shanghai? And this is a dynamic process. And Guangzhou learned philosophy. And let me ask you: Can human beings trap in the same water at the same time? Trap in two different waters at the same, at the same time? According to the latest quantum physics. There is a parallel universe, and there is another self in a different universe. Well, well, let me ask you, even if you do a citywide testing, you cannot guarantee that uh, those who tested positive will not be negative the next time. So that is why I agree with Professor Zhang. So it's not a medical concept, for example, cancer. Well, later, I'm going to ask you about cancer. And uh, for all these uh, cancer patients, um, one third of them they die from the cancer, and another third, another one third dies from uh, you know horror or being fear. Well, this is very hard to explain. So I believe in Wuhan the. Citywide testing is very important, and for 10 million people, the total testing takes 2 billion yuan. So we have to make some calculation, and uh, there is a social cost. But in Shanghai, it's not necessary. In Shanghai, we have to relax the controls uh, so that everybody has sufficient amount of freedom, and we can live and work to the fullest. And uh, in Shanghai, we have a lot of uh, Medical doctors represented by Mr. Zhang, they are very qualified. Thank you very much for your compliment. And thank you very much for your confidence in the medicine of Shanghai. And uh, Wuhan also has such capacity. And because this is a new type of coronavirus, and at the very beginning, we don't have any knowledge about this disease. And uh, I don't know the result of the test that is currently going on. But I believe that uh, after this test, we are going to have only a limited size of positive cases. And Guangzhou said something very important from many different perspectives. And there are still this fear for Wuhan. I believe you need to pay a visit to Wuhan. This is for the benefit of the people. Well, well the, the truth is that uh, you have a lot of invitations. And me, I don't have any invitations. And uh, secondly, even if I go there, I have nothing to do because they are fully qualified. 
from a medical perspective. Well, don't leave me alone here. I have to pitch in. And uh, right now and tonight, there are millions of viewers watching this program, and uh, there are uh, viewers from Wuhan and uh, Hubei province, and so don't tell them that uh, there is no invitation from Wuhan because I'm going to have a lot of comments flying on the screen. Well, let me ask you another question. In China, you know, we cannot be isolated from the whole world, no matter how, how good we do and how well we did in a fight. And uh, Guangzhou, I have visited your company, and it's running 24-7 around the clock. So as China enters a new stage of pandemic control, which we call the routine campaign against the pandemic, but this is not a reality in other countries. And uh, in this pandemic fight as a Chinese enterprise, what, what do we feel the most strongly about? Well, I think China really did very well. And uh, if you look at the other countries, some countries did also very well with the low costs, such as Japan and uh, South Korea and even Portugal. Uh, secondly, I'm personally impressed by three types of people, doctors, and I have more respect for uh, the young people, I have more hope for them. Uh, third, entrepreneurs like us, we have more, we have uh, much better self-awareness, we are patriotic, and we are patriots. Uh, when the pandemic came, and uh, I only like sleep for like two or three hours every day, and I have to make a lot of decisions in the middle of night. But right now, I have normalized my circadian clock because I don't have those many things to handle. But China truly did it very well, and uh, I truly feel proud to be a Chinese. Well, this deserves some applause. Well, we've seen how entrepreneurs did during the epidemic control. And uh, so, Professor Zhang, we cannot isolate China from the rest of the world. We have to open the doors. And I have a lot of uh, friends who come back to China. When they land on China, they are very proud. And uh, so from your side, you have been treating patients around the clock. So my question to Mr. Zhang is that if there is any pickup of the situation internationally, if we dramatically open civil aviation and, uh, civil aviation and transportation, if we're going to cope with the new situation, are we ready? Or how can we be ready? So this is the question concerning the mayor of Shanghai, because uh, the mayor of Shanghai has been discussing this on every meeting. And the medical team in Shanghai, they host two to three meetings per month. And what you have just asked is included in their meeting as well. And uh, the experts in prevention and medical treatment in Shanghai, I'm a member on both teams. And I can tell you that uh, I know all the details. And the question that you have just asked is well deliberated by those meetings. And right now, the world is in closed doors. And uh, in the, the whole world is in closed off situation. But if we continue to close our doors to each other, and no world, no country can survive this pandemic. And I paid a visit to an African country. and. It's uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, the doctors there are actually crying. I joined with the British doctors and Zimbabwe doctors, and I told them to stay at home for two weeks. And they told me it's not possible because they have to bring food on the table, and they don't have any saving. Uh, it's not like Chinese. You know, everybody here has a lot of savings, and we can't afford not working for two weeks. But I do know that some Chinese don't have any saving, but at least what we can guarantee is that the Chinese nation has always had this, uh, has always had this habit of saving. And uh, in the United States, they have an unemployment rate of 14.5%, because if you are in 
a mortgage loan, you will fail in making the repayment to banks. And if so, so, let me ask you this question: Should we close our doors for a very long period of time, or should we open our doors? I joined in a conversation with a Singapore uh, expert. Uh, he asked me, "When do you anticipate China opens a door?" And I said, "I don't know, because Singapore, you know, is very precautious." When China had this outbreak of pandemic, and they closed off the transportation links with China, and they were very precautious. So when the whole world is open, China won't close its doors 100 percent. Because when China just had the outbreak, everybody opened their door to China. And right now, when the whole world is in trouble, we cannot close our doors for the benefit of just ourselves. And this is not the tradition of Chinese. And this is not going along with the traditional philosophy of the Chinese. And uh, so we have to be nice and friendly to the West, to foreign countries. And we have to be confident. And we have to understand that uh, China's public health system has been dramatically trained and uh, improved after the pandemic. And we have to have this type of uh, confidence. <laughs> so the reopening of enterprises, those are the business of entrepreneurs, but uh, taking care of kids are the business of parents. And uh, we are all parents. and. Uh, so because of the pandemic, we got more time hanging together with our children. And uh, right now, a lot of the schools are reopening. And uh, so my question to Guangchang is that, so how should the next generation do in front of this pandemic? Well, I believe it's very difficult to wear a mask. And it's even more difficult to put off the mask. Once you have formed a habit, it's very difficult to say goodbye to the habits. And uh, for school reopening, I believe we need to do that as soon as possible. Of course, I don't want to say goodbye to my kids. And it's a good thing to be together around the clock and all the time. But we have to bring our children to other children. And they have to be together, playing and studying together. And they cannot be confined at homes. So from this perspective, I believe that it's very pertinent. It's very um, necessary that our kids go back to school. And uh, with the confidence shared by Mr. Zhang, I believe we need to do that. But let me quickly follow up. And uh, education is not just the business of education institutions or teachers. You as a entrepreneur, you know, Falsang um, International is a huge group, and it's also a leader in the industry. And reopening or resumption of work or industrial operation, in this aspect, do you have any new requirements for your employees in a new era? Well, first thing we need to do is to do well in prevention. And, uh, but right now, it's already very safe. And it's almost 100% safe. And uh, we are reopened 100%. The concern should be going to those uh, small enterprises, small businesses, like a barber shop or a small restaurant. And uh, Professor Zhang can survive like Professor Zhang has mentioned, that those small businesses can you know, sustain uh, themselves without any new revenue for two to three months. But what if, what if you know, this thing lasts for four or five months? And during the epidemic, some sectors are not affected. But in general, in China, 90% of the shopping, mall, shopping malls here have uh, reopened. And uh, during the May Day holiday, the uh, occupancy, uh, occupation rate in our hotels reached more than 50 percent. So China has entered into a stage of routine prevention and control. But I don't know what this word routine means. 
to just to just give you one example, if I'm taking a high speed train today, do I need to wear the mask all the time since I get on board the train, or do I need to, you know, or can I take it off when I get on board? And when I go to a different place, I wash my hands ten times a day. Uh, when entering the routine states, does that mean that I just need to wash my hands like five times a day? And how do you understand this word routine? And how is that different from the past few months? Well, we were born in our in in the 1960s, and uh, I was asked by a lot of friends. And in particular, students overseas. <laughs> and uh, for Guangzhang, you know, he's in a paradox, and he sells masks, and he always he's now telling people not to wear a mask. And I don't know how he learned his philosophy back in school. Well, what did you learn? I learned international relations. Well, I don't know what, why uh, Guangzhang is having such a logic. Talking about healthy life. We need to wear some uh, lower level of uh, masks well, because I'm the I'm one of the experts in disease control. Well, I cannot tell everybody not to wear a mask. Uh, this is simply unprofessional. And uh, when it is raining every day, how can you tell people not to bring an umbrella? And uh, but this is a issue of science. And about the masks, let me tell you more. From the science perspective, wearing masks is helping you to maintain a good social distancing. And uh, we're talking about reopening of factories, and everybody is coming back together and working together. So there are people gathering. And so how should we maintain social distancing? Well, the easy way is to put on a mask. In Italy and uh, in the United States, every day there are new cases. But people are reopening their factories and jobs, and uh, they're just wearing a mask, and that's enough. And uh, so, about the masks, I believe it's a dynamic issue. And let me ask you again: and Can human beings uh, get stumbled in one uh, in two rivers at the same time? Uh, well, I believe this is not the question for medical doctors. And I believe that if in the next two to three months, and there is no new cases, I don't believe it's necessary to wear a mask. But if tomorrow there is a new case, I don't even need to advise you. And I believe that everybody will be wearing masks, and this is the Chinese people. And uh, you see that uh, for a couple of weeks there has been no new cases. And then we are relaxing, and uh, we don't need you know, we don't even wash our hands after toilets. And this is not true. And uh, this should become a routine behavior of everybody. And uh, I believe that uh, in the education system, everybody is having a very high requirement, some mask wearing. And uh, But I told them that uh, when you are playing on a playground, you, you, know, you can take off your masks. And if you are talking about the confined classroom, uh, maybe you should uh, put on your mask. Well, those who studied philosophy, the are very logic, and they ask themselves, and they deny themselves, and then they question themselves. Well, the way that logic works is that you know, I, I, personally, I don't think we need to wear masks. But for the country as a whole, mask is still considered very important. And the market is there existing objectively. And uh, you need to you know, have a personal life, and you also need to give a public advice. And uh, so we are delivering and producing a mask that is environmentally friendly. So we have just released two Organic masks, 
I'm sorry to have uh, contradict, contradicted myself just now. Well, he's a big businessman, and he's on a list of uh, Forbes. And uh, let me assume that uh, if we are in a campus, then everybody would believe that you have a problem in your logic. Well, let me summarize your dialogue. You said that uh, we need to look at this issue dynamically, and there are some factors to be or not to be, and you make the decision. And uh, Guangchang said there is this issue of logic, but uh, whatever argument that you have, safety and health, they are in a first position, and everybody has to be responsible for themselves, and then be responsible for others. Uh, in particular, when you have a symptom, it's 100% necessary that you put on your mask. Otherwise, you are not being moral. And uh, if you wear a mask that can ventilate your air outside, then it's also not moral. So Professor Zhang talked about hand washing. And uh, well, I believe that should become a routine. Well, now let's talk about science. One of the most important determinants to the fight against the pandemic is the vaccine. And uh, I know Guangchang has a lot of uh, biomedicine factories and business. So, so I have actually two questions for Professor Zhang. When do you anticipate that the vaccine will be pushed to the market? Are you optimistic about the end of this year? Um, secondly, if you are optimistic about the vaccine, uh, when do you think that will be pushed on the market? So, Guangchang, please. We have a collaboration going on with a German vaccine program, and it has already entered stage one in clinic, clinic trial, and it will soon enter stage two in clinical trial. I believe science is the final weapon to win this fight, and uh, well, everybody is saying that uh, we won't have a vaccine until the end of next year. And uh, I believe the vaccine is the final weapon. <laughs> well, I'm actually surprised. He sells masks and vaccines, and he seems to know everything. And there are only a couple of different types of vaccines, and some has entered stage two, some has entered stage three. And if you look at uh, the website of the WHO, there is only one vaccine that is currently developed in the US that has entered stage three in terms of uh, clinical trial. Those are new vaccines, and uh, some are existing active vaccines. And uh, the new vaccine is uh, nucleic acid vaccine. For patients, there is still a high level of uncertainty, and there are SARS and MERS, those are the coronavirus disease, and uh, for a very long period of time, I have never seen a very reliable vaccine. Uh, suddenly now you are telling me that there is a vaccine that can be very effective. I don't believe it. And the, the best scenario is that there is one vaccine being developed, and uh, maybe March, by March and June next year, we can have some sort of vaccine. I don't know which one is going to win out, going to stand out, and maybe by next, by next year's March and uh, June, we're going to have some vaccine. And that is the most optimistic anticipation. And uh, if by that time the vaccine is not reliable, it's only possible. And it's just like a uh, fossil group, and they, uh, they might be developing 100 drugs, but maybe only 30 of them will be proven effective. And uh, if we combine all the current vaccines together, there are maybe hundreds of vaccines currently being developed. And then maybe by the end of next year, I'm talking about the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022, there will be some sort of vaccine. And, uh, but 
Well, this is the vaccine, but on the side of uh, the disease, maybe coronavirus will be with human beings for a very long period of time. And maybe there will never be a vaccine. And I believe I agree with uh, Guangxiang that so we will eventually have a vaccine. And 100%, uh, I'm sure that so we're going to win this battle with the weapon of science with a vaccine. And I have done my own calculation. If we could come up with a vaccine by next year's March, then we can dramatically scale up the production. And then by the end of next year, we will be able to vaccinate all the population in the whole world. And uh, so this is a very tough question. And that is why I'm here joining Guangxiang to talk about this. And uh, well, in the past, it's just a dialogue within the scope of uh, food and alumni. So I believe that uh, this will become a routine, this will become the new normal for two years. I believe that uh, within, you know, for these two years, we have to manage our health very well. And uh, vaccine is very important. And if we have this vaccine, if we have this vaccine, we're going to be in a different landscape. Well, I personally don't have much knowledge on vaccine, but we have the leading team, uh, which is collaborating with our German team. And I believe that so we need to listen to their views. And Professor Zhang is not that professional in this, uh, perspect, uh, in this perspective. And uh, so, so don't buy in his words. Because every day I discuss this question with my vaccine team. Well, only last week I engaged in a very extensive dialogue with a WHO expert on vaccine. I don't know which one you can believe here. And uh, well, I believe we have no disagreements. Here. Well, because. I come from the campus, and it's just like in a campus when you are moderating a session, a debate between two students, and it's very difficult. But I believe that eventually we don't have any disagreement because every road leads to Rome. So, Professor Zhang, on the management of personal health, do you have any good advice? The only benefit of this pandemic is that our kids become more obedient. If I tell my kids to wash their hands, then they will do that. And now there is a dramatic improvement of social awareness. Everybody realized that so we have to pay attention to our health. And uh, we have, uh, you know, we have to protect our own health, and that's very important. And uh, on May the fifteenth, we are gonna we're gonna launch a health plus uh, health plus initiative, and we're going to provide personal doctor services to a lot of the homes in China and. Uh, when you are sick, you need to be able to afford the medical treatments, and uh, at normal times, you need to protect your health. And when you get sick, you need to make sure that uh, you have a doctor that is taking care of you. And uh, now everybody is paying more attention to health. And uh, in the past, people all have a lot of respect for those super rich men. <laughs> But right now, things have changed. Everybody has a lot of respect for doctors. So, Professor Zhang, before asking a question, and I suddenly realized that uh, there is a plate of food or fruits. Well, some say that uh, this is specially cooked by the wife of Guangxiang. I will not spend a few minutes staring at this. You know, I, I'm wondering. You know, what is the consideration behind this dish? Well, I didn't cook this personally. I guess you are misinf misinformed. And I believe it's dinner time. And uh, because debates like this can consume a lot of uh, stamina, and that is why it is 
friendly or polite to offer you something to energize yourself. And these are the food produced by Fosan Group. It contains chicken and beef and fish, and of course a lot of vegetables and uh, fruits and nuts, which is uh, which generally uh, consists uh, make up of a uh, salad. How do you like it? So we put everything together. We used a very healthy cooking method. And for every dish, we calculate the calorie. And uh, for every dish, the calorie is controlled at uh, below 700, uh, below 700. And our food is very popular amongst the white colors. So we're in a short supply, and uh, everybody likes our healthy dish, in particular amidst this uh, epidemic. So when we were tasting, you didn't choose beef or fish or fruits. You particularly chose broccoli. Why is that? Well, this is a very tough question because on my right hand, I have uh, beef and eggs. And those are the food that I recommend, but I happen to select a broccoli. Why? You know, when I was recommending food to the population, I told people that uh, in Shanghai, most of those people with severe symptoms, they are either old people or people with malnutrition. And uh, a lot of the people with uh, severe symptoms, they just arrived in Shanghai after 10 hours of transportation. And uh, over the past 10 hours, they didn't take in a lot of uh, highly nutritious food. And that's why I believe uh, they need to take in a lot of uh, proteins. And uh, if, I, if I'm going to talk about healthy food, I believe broccoli is very healthy. And uh, you know, because the moderator himself is a great debater. I kind of know that so he's going to ask this question. And broccoli and vegetable is very important. We have to diversify our diet, and we cannot just focus on rice and meat. And if we only rely on rice and noodle, and uh, we're going to have uh, very single uh, category of uh, nutrition. Well, but I believe well, this is not cheap, right? There's no press tag, but I know that uh, this won't be so very cheap. So if you have so many combination of uh, different categories of food, you have the calculation of the calories. And uh, we are not located in the CBD area of Shanghai. And the people who work here, they don't have time, but they have money. And me, for example, I don't earn a lot of money. If I buy food, I buy simple food, as long as you can guarantee the diversity of the nutrition that you take in. But if you have a lot of money and don't have a lot of time, and then you need to balance your diet. Well, well, this is like a quote from a restaurant owner. So now, can we answer some of the questions from our netizens? Mr. Guo, you go first. Because of the epidemic, a lot of the tourist destinations and restaurants and cinema and hotels, they have closed. And uh, so you read the book of uh, Big Pandemic, which was written by Professor Zhang. And uh, so what do you miss the most after this pandemic? Well, I miss this feeling of freedom. You know, I could go to whatever country I want to go. And uh, I can go to Wuhan when I want to go. And uh, uh, because of this pandemic, we have a lot of uh, limitations and restrictions. I believe freedom is the most important. And I used to follow 
the football match of Su British Super League and uh, have lost a lot of fans. But as long as there is sunshine in your heart, as long as you have aspiration for a good life, and then you can be happy. Well, talking about interest, and in many of the public lectures that John has given to the audience, he shared a lot of his habits. What are your habits and uh, what are your interests? Well, Guangzhou says something very important. Sports match is very important. A healthy society you know, considers this an integral part of the society. And uh, sports is a very important industry. And uh, you ask me, when will the world be normalized. Well, I'm going to ask every one of you to follow the schedule of the Tokyo Olympic Games. And if Tokyo can successfully present the Olympic Games, then, then it shows that everybody will, you know, everything will go back to normal. And China is right now the front runner of the campaign of the fight against the pandemic. But I sincerely hope that uh, those cities that have been normalized, you know, they should uh, present, they should launch some uh, sports match and uh, do a lot of uh, sports activities. Well, I have uh, participated in some of the sports-related meetings. Uh, we need to consider those questions. For example, bringing in some of the international matches here to China and uh, we can broadcast live to the whole world, and the match can be organized here in China, and we can have a closed-loop management of the inbound travelers. I don't, I'm not a fan of football or basketball, but I know that those are very important to the whole world and to the health of the society. We have to take into consideration the interest of the next generation. Uh, sports is a very important part of their life. And those investors and those super rich people, and they have to be aware of this. And for me personally, I spend a lot of time reading books and boring soap operas. And uh, you know, when you are too busy and too exhausted, then you don't do anything except then, ex except for uh, watching TV. And uh, when I have problem of getting to sleep, I just listen to music. Uh, so from a philosopher's view, the essence of the world is not a sure thing. And philosophers are in pursuit of truth. So if you ask me which TV opera is interesting or not interesting, it only depends on your man side. And it's just like meditation. And uh, so, so Guan Chang, you have to ask, you have to answer my philosophical question. Well, I, I now know, you know, the pattern that you, you follow when answering questions and uh, you go philosophical whenever you, you're given a question. Well, now let me, Give the floor to Guangchang and ask Guangchang some questions. And so there are a lot of uh, SMEs asking questions. You said that uh, what's very important is those small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, as you have just mentioned, that no one can be singled out from this pandemic. And uh, SMEs, they have to survive this pandemic in the first place. So you have traveled a long journey, and uh, what advices do you have for those uh, SMEs? Well, first you need to have a good product. The better your product is, the faster you can harvest your revenue. Uh, secondly, you need to go online, and uh, traditionally you don't think it's necessary to conduct online conversations with your clients, and right now, it's necessary. And third, you need to manage the health of your 
business. I believe, I believe you need to hang on there and hold, hold your breath for a while. And uh, this is the most difficult time and you have to hang on there for yourself and also for the society. And I believe that, uh, I believe this answer deserves another, another round of big applause. Well, some countries, in some countries, they believe that uh, if you get tested with a positive antibody, and yeah, then you're ready to go back to your workplace. Uh, is that feasible? Well, this hinges upon two aspects. And uh, for any given country, the rate of uh, antibody is very low. And uh, in Wuhan, According to the survey by the Fudan University team, I can tell you that uh, the rate of antibody in a city is not very high. And uh, if you have a positive antibody rate of 50 percent or larger than 50 percent, then you still have to deal with a lot of issues and uh, uncertainties. And uh, so right now, we only have a limited population that has been tested positive for antibody. So it's not possible. And secondly, in European countries and in the U.S., they are reopening. And uh, in the U.S., they are still having this very big uh, hated argument. And uh, because the pandemic is still rising in the States, and New York has shown some signs of slowdown. And uh, only when the daily confirmed cases slow down can they go back to normal. So our advice is that from the view of the whole world, the decision you make to reopen your economy hinges upon how well you contain the disease. And China is the best in containing the epidemic. So that is why I believe it is wrong that we're not reopening our economy 100 percent. And I cannot agree with you more on this. All right, we have uh, one more question from online. And 50% uh, of the questions are about vaccines and antibody. And everybody is asking, what is the most important determinant in reopening our economy? And uh, some say that uh, even you have an antibody, and it's only existing in your body for 52 hours, and which means that uh, to be 100% safe, you need to constantly get injected the antibody and get the needle shot. Well, my experts told me that uh, we have to be vaccinated in every six months, and uh, the worst scenario is uh, three months. And uh, this is the subject of their discussion, but I still don't have any definitive answer. Well, well, this is not a fully deliberated answer, and it hinges upon the disease itself. And we don't have any reliable data, and uh, so it's not responsible for him to share this anticipation or projection. And uh, for a vaccine developer or producer, the best scenario from a commercial perspective is one vaccination per month. Well, the most successful and effective vaccine is only one needle shot can guarantee safety for one lifetime. Well, I have never seen a COVID-19 patient becomes EU again. So right now, we don't have a lot of data because the pandemic is only there for a very short period of time. And so far, we still haven't collected sufficient amount of data. And it still takes time before we could uh, have some very reliable data. But influenza is quite different. and it's mutating every year. But what is the mutation speed and rate of the COVID-19? And we still don't know. And that is why I believe that uh, we can give you an answer only after a period of time. So I need to ask something 
very seriously. You, as the doctor, do you wish to see more patients, become more patients? You get more richer. <laughs> well, finally, Guan Chang is asking a very harsh question. This is the most harsh question ever from Guan Chang. And uh, so when I was talking about vaccine, I said that uh, you have to boost. Well, don't, don't go to other subjects. Don't don't say that uh, I wish there are a lot of uh, disease out there because I sell drugs and masks. You know, I hope that uh, no one gets you. But objectively speaking, there is disease in this world. And that is why we need to develop the best vaccine, the best drugs to cure disease. Well, you cannot say that uh, we wish that there is more patients and more disease. Well, this is simply wrong. I have to you know, make this argument for all the entrepreneurs that I represent. But to put it simple, everybody has his own profession or platform or his own source of knowledge. Well, let's well, end this epidemic dialogue for the time being, because we don't have an answer at this point of time. And, uh, so what I like to hear is that uh, we are, you know, what I would like to say is that uh, we're having a very heady discussion here. So we have millions of viewers in front of this screen, and everybody is asking one question. How should we do our jobs very well in this new normal? And we're not making this argument or making this debate on our own behalf. And we are getting to the bottom of this very important question, and that is why this dialogue deserves another big round of applause. And now from you, Professor Zhang, Looking into 2021, if you have just one sentence to envision about the future, what is that sentence? Well, that's next year, and uh, we are in May already this year, and uh, the end of 2021 will be a very important point. Our experience dealing with Infectious disease is that the most deadly disease that human beings have ever dealt with can last for two years. And uh, the worst scenario is that uh, the disease can be contained within two years. I'm seeing that uh, even at uh, the end of next year, if we're not able to wipe out the disease, that we can basically contain the disease. And so let's hang on there and let's uh, stick to our efforts. And maybe by the end of next year, we're going to see some uh, turning points. So Guangchang, please. I agree with you. I believe that uh, next year is going to be a lot better than this year. And we have to hang on there and we have to be working harder. And next year is going to be much better. So we talked about philosophy here, and uh, from Guangchang's viewpoints, for any discussion, we have to follow one basic logic. The beauty of business is that it has a high efficiency of resource allocations, and in so doing, it can also solve some of the problems in the world. And this is the logic of any business in the world, because Fundamentally, all the businesses will not be judged, will not be judged economically, but morally. So that is why Guangchang holds firm to his moral belief and principles. And uh, and Professor Zhang, you know, Professor Zhang has been asking the question: Can we step into two rivers at the same time? So they give us their insights. Well, what's not, what's important is whether or not this is two rivers, then we have to 
ask the question, what is the upstream of this river? And what is the fundamental source of these two rivers? I believe the source is responsibility and globalization. And we have to embrace this understanding that in a globalized era, no one, no person, no country, and no business can isolate themselves from the whole world. So the world is beautiful, and every one of us is beautiful. So we have to get down to the fundamentals, to the bottom of the river. And if we could figure out the source question, and then we can step into three rivers and even four rivers at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much.